welcome. Welcome. Welcome to First Parish Unitarian Universalist of Arlington. We choose. We choose. We choose to be. A liberal religious community. Welcoming. Welcoming. Welcoming to all. We encourage each other on our spiritual journeys. Support one another through the changes in our lives and challenge the excesses and injustices of our time. Called to love, to love, to love, and upheld by joy. We live our faith. I invite you now to settle your body, quiet the chattering voices between your ears, situate yourself in this moment, and pray with me. Spirit of life, companion through all our days, may we hold in beloved memory Meg Candelori and Julia Jonathan. Meg, who was a longtime member of First Parish, and Julia, who moved here from California not long ago to be closer to her daughters and grandchildren. Both Meg and Julia were lifelong Unitarian Universalists, born to UU families, whose lives were celebrated in our sanctuary on consecutive days last weekend. Church is death, birth and death and every other rite of passage across the span of life. May none of us be left to make that journey on our own. Spirit of life, font of justice, may we, we recall on this seventh day in June, another June 7th, 1903, when Mary Harris Jones, Mother Jones, embarked on the March of the Mill Children from Philadelphia to President Theodore Roosevelt's Long Island summer home in Oyster Bay, New York, in order to call attention to the unspeakably harsh conditions of child labor. Mother Jones, who spoke to the great crowd assembled in Independence Park at the, begin at the beginning of the march, telling them that in Georgia, where children work day and night in the cotton mills, they have just passed a bill to protect songbirds. What about the little children from whom all song is gone? Spirit of life, protector of our highest ideals, sustainer of hope for the completion of unfinished business, may we recommit in the shadow of July 4th to our nation's fundamental founding principle that all men, all persons are created equal endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Spirit of life, source of tenderness, of humility, of forgiveness, help us to face our failings, acknowledge our trespasses, and replenish our souls in the wash of love. Please join me now in two minutes of silent reflection. It was a typical December morning for around here. Cold, but not frigid, a bit windy, somewhat raining, somewhat snowing. The sidewalks and roads were cleared, but between them was a bank of ankle deep icy slush. As president of the Lexington Education Association, I was out early helping the contract action team to set up a table for hot chocolate and coffee, bringing out piles of flyers and boxes of signs. We were lining up along the school's driveway where soon hundreds of parents would be driving by to drop their kids off for school. As each car drove by, we were going to offer them a flyer with news about how the teacher's contract negotiation process was going. 
The Lexington Education Association is an affiliate of the Massachusetts Teachers Association and the National Education Association. We have around a thousand members and we represent the teachers, secretaries, nurses, tech workers, therapists, classroom support staff, and many others who collectively make school possible for the more than 7,000 students who attend Lexington Public Schools. I am a high school science teacher and I have worked at Lexington High for 19 years. I had been more or less active in the educators union for many years. A few years before the then president showed up in my classroom and asked me to take over for him because he was resigning as a teacher and taking a new job. At the time I was bored with my classroom assignment. And so I said, yeah, I stepped back from teaching I, and I stepped into the full-time role of a union president. By nature, I'm a bat maverick, but I'm also the, a behind the scenes kind of person. I dig the damning data out of the database for someone else to present. I ask the uncomfortable questions at staff meetings, but not in public meetings. I don't seek the SOP spotlight. Taking on the president's role meant that had to change. We had been negotiating with the district for nearly a year. And in that time, little progress had been made besides agreeing to adjust the pro downs in the contract to gender neutral options. We, the educators, came to the table with dozens of carefully constructed proposals designed to ensure that the students, especially our students in need, whether the need be transitory or chronic, have access to the services they need when they need it. This took on many forms, staffing ratios for mental health providers, programs designed to attract and retain a diverse staff, cost of living adjustments so that staff are able to live somewhere, anywhere near the town we teach in. The district had responded repeatedly with saying they agreed in principle, but were not willing to commit to anything. After a year of this, the membership had had enough. I began a dialogue with the negotiating team, the executive board, and the members about changing our tactics. Staying in our lane was getting us nowhere. The saying is that some people don't change when they see the light, they change when they feel the heat. The district agreed with us in principle. They had seen the light. We had to turn up the heat. So on that December morning, I stood in the cold and hoped the membership understood that we needed them to turn up the heat. I was nervous that no one would show, terrified really, when the TV cameras started setting up. I am not one to stand up and rally the troops, but then someone handed me a megaphone. I had met with dozens of members individually and in groups who were uncomfortable or scared to show up they feared about bad evaluation, losing their jobs, their boss being mad at them, getting a bad classroom assignment, or any of a thousand other things. However, this was not something that someone else could do for them. Avon Lewis, standing on the sidewalk by herself, was not enough. We needed them to show up, to hand out flyers, to smile and wave at parents, and to make some noise. That morning, members trickled in at first, but by the time the contract day started and people had to go to their classrooms, almost 100 cheering educators lined the driveway to the high school. Parents smiled and honked. It was an incredible high. That day felt different. Walking between classrooms, talking to coworkers in the break rooms, checking in with building reps, there was a lightness in the air. Even the students noticed. We had stood together shoulder to shoulder and reminded the town that they need us. And the response from the parents had been, of course we do. As the days afterwards passed and bad things did not happen, when it became clear that many of our immediate supervisors quietly supported our positions, even if the district did not, people were emboldened to speak out, to speak truthfully and to speak up. This kind of affirmation is rare in a workplace. Most workplaces that I have been in by design devalue the workers. They empower bad managers. 
They undervalue the experience and the knowledge of the people actually doing the work. They put people in a place of fear and uncertainty. They pit people in similar positions against each other for resources they claim are scarce. But often they are only scarce because of the leader's greed. That day, standing in the slush and the rain and the snow, we were able to push back on all of that. For the first time in many of our careers, we felt powerful. We felt seen, we felt valued. And most of all, we felt it together. There were many more rallies, dozens more, all over town, at every school, at school committee meetings, select board meetings, and town meeting. We gathered over and over and over again, and some really remarkable things happened. When we were out holding signs and chanting and cheering, people met each other who do not usually cross paths. Friendships blossomed. Educators separated by departments, by grades, by schools, found out they have more in common than they, ha than they had thought. We are usually kept apart from each other professionally and personally. For the first time, for many of us, we had a chance to break that down. As public sector employees, educators are used to being treated like appliances, invisible and ignored when we are doing what you want, but a cause of stress and anger, derided for laziness, incompetency, and bad craftsmanship when we are not. But now we were seen as people, people who had to pay rent and take care of our own children. We were seen as people who care for our colleagues, especially our marginalized colleagues, who are held to a different standard than their cis, white, able-bodied co-workers. We were seen as people who cared deeply about doing a good job, but were often put in impossible situations by our bosses. These experiences ring true to so many working people, whether you work in schools or not. And because of the organizing, because we stood together, the staff and the residents, and we demanded that the schools be funded in a way so that we can provide the services that the town wants of us. Because we work together, we won. We won staffing limits. We won improved parental leave language. We won time to do all the other parts of the job that are not standing in front of kids. We won real improvements to the salary scale so more people will be able to afford to live on one job. And most importantly, we won the narrative. We emerged from this as the people who put kids first rather than putting the budget first. The modern system of, system of employment systematically devalues the voices of the workers. Union work pushes back on that. It encourages people to find a voice and use it. It encourages people to stand up for the things they know to be true and demand that their needs be met. It gives a platform for us to stand up for each other and come together, even when systems drive us apart. I am no longer the president of the Lexington Education Association. It is a grueling job, and I did it for five years, which spanned the COVID years. I am back in the classroom now, but I am not the teacher I was before. Before, I saw myself as a science teacher teaching students essential information about how the world works, foundational understandings about the basic principles of the universe. This information is important in the same way learning to read is important. If you're going to be a human in the world, understanding where rain comes from or why a ball flies through the air in an arc are just as important as being able to say something about how the United States came to be or recognize a story well told. Now, I see myself quite differently. Now, I see my job as a teacher of young people who are finding their voices. I see my job as using the content of science as a way to help kids find things they care about and to encourage them to have the agency to make a difference. I see my job as helping them find something that they care enough about to get up early for, to stand on a slushy sidewalk for, and to speak up for because there is great joy in making a difference. Thank you.